I'll tell people, I work at Google. And like, what do you work on? I design search. And they kind of pause for a second and they're like, what is there to design? Robert, and um, while that video shows that creativity, design, branding, and marketing is central to Google now, 10 years ago when I started, that was not the case. Uh, the reverse is true. It was probably um, the most intimidating, and I was the most insecure I've ever been in my whole entire life. Here was this company one of the most important companies of our time, touching billions of people's lives um, uh, with, with products that we use every day, uh, with some of the smartest people on the planet working there. I remember early on, uh, I went to leadership training, and beside me was uh, Vin Cerf, the co-inventor of the internet, doing trust falls, you know? Um, so you can imagine how intimidating it was, because here I am, uh, you know, graphic designer, art student with a BFA from Parsons. I can kern type, um, you know, art direct a photo shoot, uh, and hear rocket scientists all around me. Um, so it was, it was scary, and the whole time I was basically thinking, don't screw this up. Um, but the thing that was exciting to me was the possibility of if Google is making the future, inventing the future, how we live, how we will live, how our kids will live, how our kids' kids will live, I don't want to trust that to just the engineers. Uh, I want people with art degrees to come help shape that future. So that's the thing that uh, uh, made me join the company. Um, and it, it's extra scary because everything that I was good at in my, that made my career, branding, design, storytelling, the company had not needed at all to get to where it was 10 years ago. And it was pretty damn successful already. So, uh, but I took the leap of faith, you know, when the spaceship lands in your backyard, you gotta just have to get in it. Uh, so I joined Google, and uh, when we first got there, this is my badge, um, we were just trying to tell the company, well, this is how we might help. We would, uh, uh, we wrote a little charter and said, we will do brand management. We will do brand narratives and brand innovations. And 
Larry, Sergey, and everyone looked at us like, what are you talking about? I have no idea what you're talking about. Um, so we pretty much just threw our hands up in the air and we crafted this five-word mission statement for the Creative Lab. It's pretty much just go to work every day and try to figure out how we can be helpful and useful to the Google brand with what only we know how to do that even the inventor of the internet wouldn't know how to do. Um, so what, one of the first things we did was uh, we looked at Google search. It's an amazing product. You all use it, uh, but I, you probably don't know that every year over 900 innovations happen on Google search. No one knows about it. And uh, when I got there, I was amazed at all the things you could do. So I said, well, we should tell people about all the cool things you can do on Google search. And the other thing we thought was we should, you know, we take search for granted. We use it like it's water or the air we breathe. Um, and we want to remind the world what it is they love about Google, like emotionally, not just functionally. And uh, one of the insights we had was, you know, the engineers obsess about the quality of search. And, uh, and our thought was, well, the best search results don't actually just show up on a web page. They show up in people's lives. And we made this little video. And that was, that was pretty cool because uh, we didn't expect this, but uh, the reaction was actually, we put it online, the reaction was really great. You can instantly see what people say. This is one of my favorite comments <laughs> on the video. Um, but also internally at Google, the engineers went wild for it. Even the founders, Larry and Sergey, because it was good timing, they uh, just had their babies. And Sergey uh, wrote an email to us saying that, wow, I showed it to my wife and her friends, and they cried. I got lots of points. Uh, and, uh, and even more important, we actually taught people what you could do in search, because the next morning after, uh, well, they, they were the one that uh, said, let's put that TV on air. And they put it on the Super Bowl, and it was Google's first TV ad. Google had never put an ad up on TV before. It was for Google's first TV ad. And the next day, Howard Stern on the radio show, if anyone knows, he's just, he doesn't like anything. Um, he, he, he said uh, on, on the ear, like, wow, did you guys see that ad, that Google ad on the, soup, on, the, on the game last night? I did not know you could do those things. So we actually was able to get people to understand all things you could do at Google. So that was, that was cool. And Larry and Sergey, you know, they loved it. They said, hey, why don't you guys try to bake your creativity into our products, uh, not just marketing. And uh, the first natural place was uh, the Google Doodle. So uh, I'll just play this little video. at Google, you realize like, it's, it's not just cool to make things, it's cooler when other people make cool things with what you make. 
Um, so now we're getting a little bit of reputation at Google. And uh, Larry, and Larry, just before he became CEO, he turned to us and asked, hey, can you redesign all of Google? Uh, and the reason he asked us and not the design team, because at that time, all the, group, uh, all the designers were in each product area. So they all segregated into different groups. And we were the only group outside of the main company that could look horizontally across anything, uh, everything and be objective. And we're like, uh, we're not product designers. He goes, ah, you know, just give it a shot. And you have two weeks to redesign all of Google. That's YouTube, Gmail, Google, everything. And we're like, OK. Uh, and so what we did is uh, we took the 10 most trafficked web pages of Google, and we printed it out on uh, 11 by 17 paper. So we have all of Google printed out. And then we did mock-ups of what they could look like that after. And we did version one, 10 pages, version two, 10 pages, version three, et cetera. Uh, and then it took us, I think, I think, three weeks because we couldn't get on this calendar. Um, three weeks later, we brought a stack of printouts to Larry. And he was looking at it. Uh, and he was very interested to redesign all of Google before he became CEO. Um, and he said, oh, this is kind of cool. And he said, we should do this. And then he took those comps and had a meeting with 27 of the SVPs of the company and said, hey, you guys, we're going we're gonna to relaunch, redesign all of Google. And so that's what happened. Uh, and he said, you have to, you know, we have to launch it in the summertime. And they, in about four months' time, they redesigned all of Google. Uh, so everything, the experience that you, you know, they have now with Google, that look and feel, that the material design, that's all based on this work that was done about seven years ago. Um, and that was pretty cool. Um, Larry became CEO at the time, and uh, you know the press was wild about it and said that uh, you know before if Google was known for "Don't be evil," under Larry's uh, leadership, it's "Don't be ugly," and that was that. Uh, but no matter how great technology is, I think at the end of the day, it's what people do with the technology that's more amazing. So there was a story that inspired me of a Google engineer who, um, you know, he had a young daughter, and he created a Gmail account for her and started writing to her when she was born, and he was going to give her the email address when she became of age so that she would read all the messages that he, would have, he had been written her her whole life. And I thought that was so beautiful. So when we launched Chrome, we made this video. I had two young girls, so I used to cry every time I watched this video. Uh, but it reminds me of a quote from Maya Angelou, uh, which is, people don't remember what you say. People don't remember what you do. People will always remember how you made them feel. And here we are, you know, marketing a browser. Um, but one of the things I've learned being at Google is that it's half the time you don't know where you're going to end up. So you just have to just put yourself in there. Imagine some end state, uh, paint a picture of it, and bring it back. So this is a story of uh, this comp, this mock-up, um, 
um, was made before Google had a hardware division. So Chrome was making Chromecast, and uh, we knew that the Pixel phone was going to launch, and there's a separate group that was making the smart speaker product. Um, and so we saw that like all these groups at Google were making their own hardware, and the company's going to bet big on it, and we knew that if we let everyone just go, there's going to be different packages, different whatever. So we made this mock-up of like, hey, wait, we should look like we're from one company. And we had a naming system, you know, Pixel, Phone by Google, Home, Smart Speaker by Google, et cetera, et cetera. And we made this one printout. I think a designer took like one day to do it. And, and that kind of rallied the whole company together. Oh, yes, this is how products from one company would look like versus it being all different and all over the place. And, uh, and then our CMO showed it to the different product groups, and then finally, it actually, uh, we actually hired Rick, who then ran our hardware group. Um, and so we kind of invented the unification of our hardware products before there was even a team. And I call this a little bit like writing the fiction of the science. We all know that science fiction um, inspires a lot of things that happens in, 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 uh, in technology. And, but he already just made it up, right? He just like invented something. Oh, it wouldn't be cool if we flew and, or take a pill and we just jump into the future. And scientists, oh, inspired by it. And so they try to, try to achieve that. So we kind of take the same approach. We realize that creative people can you know, make up stuff that the engineers can then go build. Uh, so one example of that, too, was like computer vision and machine learning was becoming you know, really, really exciting, getting really, really good. So imagine what happens with computing when a computer can see and understand what it sees. And all these different groups across the company were working on all these uh, product launches and features across Google Photos, the camera, the Android, et cetera. But it was all different. And we thought, well, why don't we just stitch it all together, make it feel like it's one thing. And we made a video of what happens when this thing comes to life. And actually, I can't play that video because uh, it's under lockdown. The company feels it, that it's that valuable. Uh, uh, but, at, we, but in the video, there are examples of how this technology would work. You'd point your phone at something. It would it'd tell you what it is. Uh, and we would invent these use cases. Well, it'd be really useful if you guys have ever done this, come across this. Uh, like, wouldn't it be great if it just signs onto your, the Wi-Fi network uh, automatically, or if you're holding it on the street, it would just recognize things. Um, and that was so compelling that uh, our CEO decided to launch this at I.O. two years ago. Um, and to launch anything, we kind of have to create a logo, and we created a you know, we made up a name. Um, and one thing that Andy Burnt, my boss always says, like, to name a thing is to invent a thing. So we just made this whole thing up of all this pile of technology that was happening in the company. Um, and we launched Google Lens, and now it's showing up in your products. Uh, but the cool thing was after this event, um, the financial press, one of the big headlines was Google's stock is going to go over 1,000 finally with this product. So we, and we just made that up. So the, the, the summary of this thing is that I've realized that um, you know, perhaps people with art degrees are some of the best people to help invent the future. Um, and because so much stuff is the, you know, compartmentalized and specialized. A lot of innovation is happening, but innovation is not necessarily happening in a whole. So you take a very complex company or institution, and all the different people doing all different things from marketing, you know, uh, uh, partnerships, R&D, product design, et cetera. But at the end of the day, the only thing that matters, it's what spit out from this company. And things that manifest into stuff that customers and users and the world actually sees and touches and hears and smells and feels. Um, and creative people, or if you know, your partners that you work with are some of the best people to create those futures of what that would look like in the form of a mock-up, a video, a prototype. So we tell our team to spend all your time making these objects, these artifacts that get people to feel what the, what the tangible future is and rally 
all the people, you know, from different groups to go, yes, let's go that way, let's build that thing. And I call this lead by Photoshop. And it's been a really, really powerful, powerful tool. Um, and, you know, with that, like the 10 mock-ups became the redesign of all of Google. Um, so, I, you know, earlier we talked about like technology. What, uh, we often think technology is the key driver of innovation. Not true. Fake news. It has always been, and it always will be, the human heart and the human imagination that move things forward, that invents the future. Um, our desires of what we want to change the things that are bad, our hope for things that we, we desire, and our creativity and ingenuity to make that so. Um, so that's, that's very exciting to me. So even though I'm, uh, you know, I definitely subscribe to the no, I don't think you know, artificial intelligence is going to take our jobs. Uh, if you, you know, I think they'll take parts of our jobs, the grunt work, hopefully, that you don't really like to do. Uh, but I think the parts where we invent and imagine how things could be and make up things that we want, um, that part is hard for machines because they don't live in the world that we live in. Um, and I've come to this realization, a little epiphany a couple of years ago, that literally everything is made up. Everything. Countries, religions, laws, chicken yakitori. I mean, someone, one person probably, decided to skewer dark meat with scallions and brush it with soy sauce and brown sugar, and it's a thing. Now you can't go to a restaurant where they don't serve it. Like, uh, and it's not just in Japan, it's everywhere. And so, you know, the interesting thing is that all good things, all things that we take for granted in our lives, are usually made up by one person or a small group of people doing something really cool, and then everyone adapts to it. Um, so um, that's kind of the wrap up. Uh, I, I feel like we, if we live in an age now un more unique than ever before where one person could do something and if it's good, it spreads faster than anything else in this connected world. Uh, the cost of distribution is, and manufacturing is lower than ever before. So all I can say is that um, there's a future to be made and you don't have to be a rocket scientist to make it. And I'll just end with this one uh, story of uh, a little girl in third grade who was drawing, and the teacher said to her, what are you drawing? And she says, God. And to which the teacher said, well, no one knows what God looks like. To which she said, well, they will when I'm done. <laughs> so I don't think anyone knows what the future will look like. But if you use your creativity, listen to your heart, what you want, Maybe they will when we're done. Thank you.